microphone as well here. Okay, can folks hear me? Okay, great. I'd like to thank uh, Daniel and the other organizers for inviting me to give you a tutorial on fault-tolerant quantum computing. Um, uh, like Todd, uh, there's a lot of material to talk about in just one hour. Uh, fortunately, though, I have a bit of a, re a, le a release valve that uh, Todd did not have. Um, Robert Rausendorf will be speaking after me about how fault tolerance applies to surface codes, and Daniel Gosman will give a, be giving a keynote talk at the end of this uh, workshop on Friday, uh, also about fault tolerant quantum computing. So any of the topics that you don't hear about here, you may hear about in these other uh, talks uh, following mine. Uh, so because of that, I've uh, structured this tutorial to really focus more on the of quantum computing, you know, what comprises a, a fault tolerant quantum computing protocol. Uh, how does it work, and not so much on the analysis of fault-tolerant quantum computing protocols, which is uh, really a subject in and of itself. Um, okay, so uh, if we're going to talk about fault tolerance, uh, maybe we should define what fault tolerance is. Uh, so fault tolerance is the ability to function uh, correctly in the event of a failure, and like uh, Todd mentioned, uh, we typically aren't able to handle every possible failure, but uh, certain set of failures. Uh, it's important to realize not only that, but also to understand what the process is. If you actually bother to read these end user license agreements uh, on your software, you'll notice some of them say this software is not fault tolerant, not intended for aircraft, you know, navigation or nuclear uh, power plant, you know, uh, you know, uh, software. Um, those are things that you want to be fault tolerant. Well, what's the process that it's supposed to to? It's not getting you from point A to point B. It's, it's not killing you. Uh, so it's important to know, you know, that the failures which, uh, you know, an airplane is supposed to be fault tolerant to isn't necessarily getting you to your destination, but to um, protecting the cargo inside. So uh, a more mundane example uh, in, is just to protect the data, to protect uh, information. It could be classical or quantum. And uh, uh, if that information is supposed to just be static, we say that's protecting a memory. It's just staying there. But if we're trying to get the information from point A to point B, then we say it's communication. We're trying to protect communication. Uh, and the failure uh, set that we're going to think about is a very narrow set, just the corruption of the data itself, nothing else. And uh, coming from, let's say, local environmental noise. So it's not adversarial, it's just some sort of local noise source. And uh, there's a solution to this, which we just heard about, error correction. It works classically, it works quantum mechanically. And uh, the solution uh, involves adding layers of redundancy and extra processing in order to achieve um, and we're assuming, again, that those processes in the error correction setting are themselves ideal. So the only faults that we're worried about are corruption to the data. And so this process for that narrow uh, failure set is, in fact, fault tolerant. We can um, lower, we can suppress the failure probability in data to whatever level epsilon we desire by adding, by using a code that's sufficiently large. It has to be uh, order log of 1 over epsilon large. Um, uh, to protect the information. Uh, that'll work as long as the error rate per data uh, satisfies some criterion, an error threshold. So if we uh, have a local noise model where each bit, say, flips with probability p, then as long as that uh, bit flip rate is below some critical value, which I'll call the error threshold, then it is possible by using a larger and larger code in th that a certain family uh, to um, uh, suppress errors arbitrarily well. So error correction is itself a fault tolerant process to a very narrow error set. But if you think about this a little while, you realize that this isn't completely satisfactory because uh, a more realistic model should account for uh, failures in the processing that's itself used to protect against those errors. That's a really natural thing to consider. Uh, moreover, um, uh, we can get a little bit more greedy and say, well, now that we've protected the information uh, very well, we want to actually do something with it. We don't want to just have it sit there. We want to build computers, not just hard drives. And uh, so we'd like to be able to process the information in a coded form. It's not a good idea to you know, decode the data, process it while it's exposed to noise, and then re-encode it. That doesn't seem like a particularly robust uh, way to do things. So uh, generally, we use the, the expression uh, fault tolerant quantum computing to refer to protocols that uh, work you know, arbitrarily well or efficiently also in the presence of faults to both its data and its processing. And uh, two of the central questions uh, overall in the field of fault tolerant quantum computing are exactly the uh, com of computation models, control models, and noise models that will admit fault tolerant quantum computation. We actually only know a very nar narrow class of combinations of these models that will allow fault tolerant quantum computing, um, despite that there's quite a large body of literature in the field. 
And it'll be interesting to no understand if there are, you know, if the if nature admits other combinations. The uh, uh, other central question of the field, I would say, is uh, what are the resource costs for achieving fault-tolerant quantum com computations? So it's one thing to say that it's possible. There's another question to ask, well, just how difficult is it? It would be particularly exciting if nature had discovered a way to do it by itself. Okay, so uh, before I launch into fault-tolerant quantum computing, let me spend a moment talking about fault-tolerant classical computing, something which uh, even some of the, I think, quantum computing experts might be less familiar with. So uh, modern computers, as we all know, are, uh, are very reliable. They can calculate for weeks or maybe even years. I've, I've certainly run calculations that lasted months, but nothing ever that's run at somebody here in the audience has. Uh, but they're very reliable. And it's not because that the hardware is particularly fault tolerant. It's just that it's very good. The error rates are so low in these things that in a, the time scale of a computation we're interested in doing in our human existence, it just doesn't fail. Um, however, we could, uh, we know that in principle it is possible to do uh, classical computation even with faulty ha hardware and I think we're beginning to enter the, a new age in classical information processing where this is a acceptable way of doing computing uh, you know we uh, there are demands to use less power on our cell phones and our smartphones and things like this or or to save money if you're a business you might find that it's cheaper to build lousy hardware and hire a couple of engineers to make it work right than it is to build better components in the first place so it's possible that fault tolerance, you know, will sort of have a revival, I think, and we're starting to get to that point as we're getting these parts very small. Fault tolerant classical computing will begin to come to the fore again for, unfortunately, not great scientific reasons, but probably for economic reasons. Um, in the setting of, of classical computing, we'll, we'll narrow it again here. We'll talk about circuits and more specifically formulas. So this is a, a narrow class of circuits where each gate in the circuit has a single output. So, for example, AND or NOT gates, things like this. And um, uh, where uh, the control model is that we're going to admit parallel operations. So we'll allow AND and OR gates to happen at the same time, say. And we're also going to allow ourselves to refresh bits. Uh, this is a very key assumption. If noise is being introduced to our system, it's generating entropy in our system, we need some means for expelling it from our system if we're going to try to protect it. And so we're assuming that we have some mechanism for doing that classically. Uh, and our noise model uh, is going to be very simple for this computational model. We'll say a noisy gate looks like an ideal gate, and then it'll be followed by a bit flip with the probability p. And uh, so that's the setting that we have, and the approach for fault-tolerant classical computing is to simulate this ideal formula uh, with a faulty formula. And you want to simulate it to desired precision. Uh, so that's one of the key ideas I'd like to get across in this tutorial, is that fault-tolerant quantum computing is really all about simulation. It's about simulating a faulty pro an ideal process with a faulty one. That's sort of the overall guiding principle. It's not about computing in its own sake. It's about simulating something that you'd like to have ha happened, but it didn't happen. And the second uh, part of this approach that I'd like to get across is that the, the way we do this simulation is to um, structure it so that it suppresses error spreading. That's sort of the key idea. How do we simulate something well? We simulate it well by uh, making sure that when errors do occur, yeah, maybe they grow a little bit, but they don't sort of grow catastrophically and cause the entire simulation to crash. Uh, that's something that we'd like to avoid. So there's this uh, uh, celebrated threshold theorem for fault tolerant classical computing um, by von Neumann uh, starting in the 50s, and he's had uh, you know, extensions of that all the way through the 60s, that says that it is in fact possible to an arbitrary formula with G gates to a precision epsilon by just using logarithmic overhead. So an order g log g over epsilon uh, gate faulty formula. Uh, and again, there is a criterion, a caveat here uh, as a function of the noise model that says as uh, this is possible um, whenever that the uh, error rate is below a critical uh, parameter. In this case, I'm going to call that the accuracy threshold uh, to distinguish it from the error threshold that's used in just straight quantum error correction. So, uh, if you're familiar with at all with this, you might this area. You might think, well, this is kind of a dead field. You know, it's been many years since people have studied this, and you know, the hardware is all really good. So why would we care? Uh, theoretically, it's interesting as well. There have been recent developments um, exploring uh, the prospects of fault tolerant classical computing. It's only in 2008 that we've learned that the uh, threshold for fault tolerant classical computing, if you restrict all the gates to just have two two bit inputs and one bit outputs, is 8.9 percent. So um, and that's tight. So that's the best you could do in this formula, in this model here. So when you hear people discuss thresholds for fault tolerant quantum computing of you know ten to the minus three, ten to the minus four, whatever, bear in mind that in fault tolerant, you, you, fault -tolerant classical computing, it's eight point nine percent. 
is the, the best you could do with faulty classical components. Um, the, uh, I should add also, though, that just because this is 8.9 percent in principle doesn't mean that fault-tolerant quantum computing couldn't have a higher threshold, uh, because we typically assume that the classical computing that augments a quantum computation is itself ideal. You might imagine some clever scheme which could somehow dump all of the errors into the classical computer, and then since we're artificially assuming the classical computer is perfect, could boost the threshold. But it seems to me unlikely. So I, I'd say this is, while not a strict barrier or strict upper bound to uh, uh, the threshold for fault-tolerant quantum computing, it's likely you're not going to find a quantum uh, computer with a threshold higher than this. Uh, and if you allow yourself to have gates that are, have uh, an inputs greater than like 3, 5, 7, et cetera, uh, then actually you can push the classical threshold all the way to 50 percent. It just, to, you know, you can asymptotically approach that. So we can get very high thresholds for fault-tolerant classical computing if we incre increase the uh, uh, basis of gates that we're allowing. Okay, so that's fault-tolerant classical computation. What about quantum computation? So we need to uh, uh, define the setting here. Uh, the first thing we need is a computational model. And right now, uh, as things stand, there are four computational models that are known for quantum computing. And they all have variants uh, of them. Uh, there's the first three, the Turing machine, walk, and adiabatic models. Um, they're not known to be fault tolerant. They're interesting. The Turing machine is sort of more of an academic one. It's the only model that's really self-contained. Uh, the other three models require a classical Turing machine to construct uniform families of objects in them. So the quantum Turing machine is the only self-contained quantum computational model we know. That's kind of interesting. The walk model, it's not known to be robust. It, it's likely to be subject to Anderson localization that Landauer mentioned, I guess, in our rec recording of the in introduction that we saw uh, before we heard about this. Um, there might be ways around that. The adiabatic model has a lot of intrinsic robustness to noise from uh, the way it, uh, you know, it's gap protection and certain control robustnesses, but it's not known to be fault tolerant. The, the only thing we know to be fault tolerant is a circuit model. This is the model where we take an arbitrary computation and we decompose it into these elementary pieces and we make each of the pieces good and put them back together again and make the computation whole. And those pieces might be implemented in ways that are either topological or through holonomies or through local measurements or whatnot, uh, but that's, that's what we're working with. So this, for, from here on out, I'm going to be restricting the circuit model. In the control model, um, there are a number of uh, assumptions that are made in fault-tolerant quantum computing analyses. Uh, I've color-coded these here uh, for ones that are either necessary, helpful, convenient, or So in the control model, uh, uh, parallel operation is, uh, is actually provably necessary uh, for uh, a fault-tolerant quantum computing protocol. You, if you're fixing errors over here and you let things over there fall apart, by the time you get over there, they'll have fallen apart. You have to really keep on top of the whole system at once in order to have any hope of keeping it from crashing. Uh, keep in mind, you don't need perfect parallelism. You don't need to have the maximal parallelism possible. Maybe every 10 steps you get to look over here, and that will impact the you know, performance of the protocol, but you need to have some degree of parallelism. Uh, you need a way to dump entropy. Again, that's provable. You have to have a way to refresh your qubits in this case. It's convenient to uh, assume, uh, what do they call it, helpful. It's helpful, sorry, to assume that you have fast classical computation, so instantaneous, if you like. It's not necessary. In fact, it's probably not even realistic. I mean, you're probably going to push our quantum computers as fast as our classical electronics can go. It's, but it's a, you know, it's a theorist's uh, you know, delight, uh, you know, put these helpful assumptions in. And you can take them down, and there are thresholds uh, theorems for that when that's relaxed. Uh, we have a finite, a specific finite gate basis, so we typically uh, pick one. Uh, it might actually be necessary to have a finite gate basis of some kind. I don't have a theorem that says that, but it seems plausible. Uh, but what I mean by this is that we assume a particular gate basis. So when we do an analysis, we pick a gate basis and say, this is the one we're going to use. Uh, moreover, we assume that each of those gates has an equal amount of time. This is, again, typically not realistic measurements in a hardware, you know, often have a different time scale than the coherent gates, say. Uh, two realistic assumptions, though, that are worth considering is uh, a 2D layout. So many quantum technologies are naturally laid out in two spatial dimensions. And so uh, that's something to think about uh, when you think about locality. Uh, in particular, uh, it's plausible to believe that all of the quantum processing that's realistic to do can only occur between information that are relatively close to one another. It's um, unlikely to imagine that you could do something uh, between two parcels of quantum information that are distantly separated as easily as you could if they were close together. Uh, for a noise model, 
uh, it's necessary to have a non-increasing error rate. If the rate of errors in your system grows as the size of the system grows, then you're fighting an ever-growing demon and there's no hope of, uh, of ever catching up with it. Uh, so you need to make sure that uh, it's not increasing uh, as you grow, or at least it's not increasing at the same rate at which you uh, could uh, possibly put redundancy in to correct it. Uh, it's helpful to assume that the classical computation that augments the protocol is not only fast but reliable, and also that uh, qubits don't leak. Uh, so we'll assume that our qubits are there and they don't just disappear. Uh, it's helpful to assume that the noise is uncorrelated, uh, that each qubit is its own independent noise source. Again, we can relax this assumption. And uh, finally, it's convenient to assume that the uh, noise doesn't depend on the state of your system. So, you, you know, if your qubit is encoded in a 1 versus a 0, you might, in a real hardware, you might think that it's more exposed. You know, if it's like in a higher energy state for one but not for the other, you might think that it, there's a sort of state-dependent noise. Uh, we're not going to assume that. We're going to assume that the errors are a function of the gates and the, the operations, not of the states themselves. And uh, we'll assume that the, uh, the gates are uniformly faulty. So if I do a, a C naught gate now and then I do a C naught gate an hour from now, I'm going to assume that it's going to have the same failure model, which again isn't necessarily the case, but it's a, a natural assumption to make. So there are all kinds of assumptions, and uh, I guess the main message from this slide is that uh, whenever you read a, an ana a description of a fault tolerant quantum computing protocol in the literature, be keep a, a watchful eye on what the set of assumptions and the models uh, involved are because they can change the results dramatically. Okay, so uh, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about fault tolerant quantum computing like in applications. So suppose we want to uh, simulate a particular circuit. So in this case I've got, uh, I guess it's an inverse uh, quantum Fourier transform. I know it's not particularly legible, but uh, you know there's some circuit you'd like to simulate. Um, Every fault-tolerant quantum computing protocol that we know of has four components to it. That's what maybe there's other ways to come up with it, but right now we just know four. And, and they themselves can be broken into two pieces. Oops, I'll move this arrow here on the screen. So the, um, we, we have a fault-tolerant quantum error correction protocol and then a protocol for doing encoded computation. And the error correction protocol has, got, has three pieces. We have an infinite family of codes a protocol for extracting the syndrome from each of the codes. So this is implicitly assuming we're doing stabilizer coding or syndrome-based decoding. Um, a decoding algorithm for interpreting the syndrome. So once we have all this classical information that tells us what the syndrome, how do we infer what the errors are given that? That's a classical protocol. Uh, it's called decoding uh, for historical reasons. It doesn't mean unencoding like doing the inverse of the encoding circuit. It just means inferring the errors uh, given the syndrome. And then a finite gate basis that's universal and a way to implement each of those. So uh, when we have these four pieces, how do we actually affect a fault tolerant quantum circuit? Well, the first thing we do is we take our ideal circuit, this thing here, we compile it into a circuit over our gate basis. It'll get a little bit larger when we do that. Th then we choose a code that's large enough to suppress those errors uh, below one over the size of the new circuit with fault tolerant quantum error correction. And um, so, uh, in order to know what, you know, it's the, the algorithm dictates the size of the code we use. If you have a really big algorithm, you go to your infinite code library and you dial a big enough code to handle that. And the, fault, the protocol is designed to not propagate errors badly, so you just need to suppress errors to one number of gates. You don't have to worry about the spreading of the errors in that circuit. Once we do that, uh, then we replace each of the gates in the circuit. We've chosen the code. Now we replace all of the gates in our compiled circuit with the encoded versions of it with this code. And after each gate, we insert a syndrome extraction. Um, some of them might be built to be omitted, depending on the structure of the actual algorithm. And uh, we uh, in instantly know, because we have the instant <coughs> classical computational model, we instantly know the decoding uh, after the syndrome extraction, but we don't actually apply it all the time. Uh, that itself could be faulty. So we only apply it when we need to, which is before each non-Clifford encoded gate. Uh, you heard in the previous talk what these Clifford gates were. And at the very end, uh, we do a measurement. We do a logical measurement of all the information. We do classical decoding of the final outcomes to infer the result because although the fault tolerant quantum computing protocol is keeping errors from propagating badly, when they get to the very end, you can't errors in that very final time step. What you can do is classical error correction, since you're assuming the classical computer is ideal, to uh, boost the, um, uh, or suppress the failure rate in that final measurement. Okay, so let's go through these steps in a bit more detail here. So quantum compiling, this is our first step. 
So, so here's our uh, inverse uh, Fourier transform circuit. And uh, so we're going to compile. You can see that there's these rotations uh, here, you know, by pi over 2, pi over 4, pi over 32, et cetera. You know, if you had a really big Fourier transform, you can imagine you have really teeny tiny rotations here. And if you have a finite gate basis, you're not going to have all of those. So we compile it. And uh, the uh, degree to which we want to compile it is a, uh, or how, well, the compiling itself is a simulation. You know, we can only approximate each of these gates to some precision. And you might, want, you might ask, well, how well do I have to approximate each gate in this circuit? That itself is a function of the overall circuit itself. So that's a, one of these places where global and local information interacts. You need to know the whole circuit, the number of gates in the entire circuit to know how well you need to approximate each gate in the circuit with this quantum compiling. So in, if there are G gates total in the circuit, you need to simulate it with uh, your quantum compiling to order 1 over G. So the Soloveig-Kataev algorithm guarantees that we can do this and do it very well. Uh, there's a particular uh, explanation uh, by Dawson and Nielsen. They have a variant of it that's very nice, uh, where you can actually, if you're given a gate uh, u, you can find an approximation, uh, and you want to get an approximation, an epsilon approximation to it. You can do it in uh, log to a power of 1 over epsilon. You can actually find the approximation sequence in a time faster than the sequence itself because of the, the uh, description is compressed. Uh, and so when you do this, uh, we go to compile the circuit. If our original circuit had G gates in it, our new one has logarithmic, uh, poly -logarithm polylogarithmically more gates uh, in the new circuit. And this is the circuit that we're going to simulate fault tolerantly. So this is our first step. Uh, now we have to choose a gate basis. So there are lots of finite gate bases from which to choose. So if you're the kind of person that likes to keep it real, uh, there's a real gate basis. You can use the Hadamard and the Toffoli. Uh, Yao Yun Chi showed that this is a universal gate basis. Uh, of course, we augment it with the ability to prepare and measure states as well to get a sort of a complete gate basis, not just the coherent part. Uh, if you like the Hadamard gate and want to just add a two qubit gate, Kataev showed you could add the controlled S or, or uh, phase gate to the Hadamard to make it universal. You'll be hearing in the next talk by Robert uh, that uh, the the surface code cluster state gate basis, you can have a controlled phase, controlled Z gate, Hadamard, and some preparations and measurements, and a an unusual measurement actually, augmented with these to get universal quantum computing. Uh, in all of these, though, the one I think that's most discussed in the literature I'll call the standard uh, gate basis, it's the Hadamard gate, the T gate, or so-called pi over 8 gate. It's the pi over, uh, uh, by the Z axis by pi over 4, but because of the half angle formula, it's pi over 8. Um, and a controlled knot. Um, it's convenient to actually use not, that's a very parsimonious basis. We can expand it, include uh, all of the gates and their inverses. And uh, that's useful for the quantum compiling algorithms, which typically require that. Uh, so there's this more com over complete one. I I'd say a favored uh, gate basis in fault taunt quantum computing constructions is this latter one here, where um, the only coherent gate we have is the controlled knot gate, and everything else is uh, preparations and measurements. So these, uh, this first collection of uh, uh, operations uh, is what we'll call the CSS set of gates. These are gates that have particularly nice implementations for CSS codes that I'll be describing later. Um, we can add preparation of the so-called plus i state, uh, 0 plus i1. I, I've got a little legend up here for those of you not so familiar with this notation. Um, a bit congested here as well. If you uh, have difficulty understanding me, <laughs> uh, please ask for clarification. Um, the, uh, this pl adding this plus i state allows you to get the entire Clifford group in encoded form. And then this t state allows you to do the t gate and get universal quantum computing. Uh, so this is great. Uh, but to actually use it, um, uh, well, there's a couple of things to realize. One, we don't have x or z gates, but that's OK. Uh, we can propagate those for forward, there's this uh, Gottesman nil theorem that tells us that um, we don't actually need to know those. We can just uh, keep the information in our head and propagate it forward. Uh, and to do the S, T, and H gates, uh, we can do it with these so-called magic states. Uh, so it, this pi over 2 state, which is the same as this plus i state, we can use that and uh, the other operations. Again, we don't actually need the z here to uh, affect the S gate. And using this pi over 4 state or the T state, we can get the T gate. Um, and the plus state you can think of as a magic for the H gate. So we're able to, uh, any time then in our original circuit where we had an S or a T or an H, we have to add this extra layer of circuitry, and it blows up our circuit that much larger still. I have this little warning here is that uh, you might think that this is a Clifford circuit because S 
is a Clifford gate, but the classically controlled S gate is not a Clifford gate, even though uh, because a single bit flip on the classical control will cause the um, S to not operate correctly. Okay, so we've got our we've got our circuit. You know, we've got it compiled. Now we need to pick a code. Uh, well, for that we need an infinite code family. We need to go large enough to get the right code. And uh, well, one way to get an infinite code family is to just pick a code and concatenate, you know, concatenate, concatenate, concatenate. And so, you know, you can get some elaborate structure like this three-dimensional Sierpinski gasket with wheels within wheels kind of thing. And uh, um, there are many, many such codes that have been studied in concatenate literature. Uh, we know that you can use any stabilizer code as a base to concatenate, but these CSS codes, which you heard about earlier, are particularly nice. Um, the lingo that gets used in the field is we, we talk about different levels of concatenation, where the zeroth level is the physical level of qubits, and each higher level is another layer of encoding on top of that. A neat thing about error, about concatenation, is that uh, error detecting codes are handy in this scenario because although error detecting codes, um, uh, they can only detect errors, they are able to uh, correct located errors. And so if you have concatenation and something, an error happen, is detected on a lower block, the block where the error is detected is now located for the higher level of code, and that error detecting code can correct that. So there's a, a large role for error detecting codes in addition to uh, error correcting codes uh, in concatenation. And uh, I won't belabor this, this full list of codes, but there are uh, quite a few here, and um, you know, pick your favorite and concatenate away. Now instead of uh, taking your codes and concatenating them, you can tessellate them instead. This is another way to get an infinite family of codes. There are many ways to get infinite family of codes, but these two, I think, are the most widely studied. So you can tessellate the code by thinking of it, uh, laying it out in space, and then thinking about how you can glue it together to get larger and larger codes. And uh, the goal in doing this is to keep those, the, the checks, this is the language I use for uh, stabilizer generator, so the, it's a lot easier to say, to keep the checks local, so you want to measure local checks. Um, but have the logical operators be global uh, over the entire uh, area in which you've tessellated. So uh, strictly speaking, these are homological codes. So homology is the theory of boundaries. And uh, so the idea here is that the uh, logical operators in these codes are boundaryless, and the checks are themselves boundaries, like little faces or something like that. Uh, and so there's this close connection between homology and topology, so they're also called logical codes as well. Uh, I think maybe that scares a lot of people off. I mean, if we call them tessellated codes, maybe they wouldn't be seem, seem so frightening. Um, and so uh, you can do this kind of tessellation in one dimensions, two dimensions, three dimensions, whatever you'd like. Uh, naturally, we're focused on two dimensions, although there are some hardwares that work in 3D and some that are stuck in 1D. Um, uh, not all such codes are good, so I'll, I'll show you later. The Bacon Shore codes you can imagine putting on a very large lattice, but they don't perform well themselves as fault-tolerant quantum computing, or codes for fault-tolerant quantum computing protocols. They're good for a base code that you can concatenate, but if you just thought of them as an infinite family of codes on larger and larger lattices, they, they don't have a threshold, so that's not good. Um, so here's, again, a list of codes that uh, I'm aware of uh, that, uh, and I'm sure there are more, uh, for um, tessellating a, a code in uh, space to come up with an infinite family. Uh, incidentally, these three codes here, these color, these are color codes, they start with ODE, and they grow, the, they tessellate them in three different ways. So there, it's another way to grow an infinite family of codes from a Steen code than just concatenating it. And this code here, this is from uh, Hector Bombin, uh, uh, in collaborator, uh, in the um, uh, how to um, do a, a three-dimensional color code. Uh, it's just the same as the 1513 Reed Muller code. Okay, so uh, uh, how well do these codes perform? Well. Uh, Typically what we look at, we look at, well, what's the failure probability of the uh, system or the code as a function of the input probability per uh, elementary data, piece of data, let's say. And if we concatenate the codes, then we find that uh, as we increase the code size, these curves, they start to become steeper and steeper and all intersect at the point uh, roughly where they line P equals P fail. Now it drifts a little bit, though, so we call this... Uh, the, you know, any particular point, a pseudo threshold. So we talk about a level one threshold, level two, et cetera. Um, and uh, I'd say, I think it's fair to say that we don't really understand well how that drifting occurs. So when people who do numerical simulations, they report a value as a pseudo threshold, but they don't, it's hard for them to know exactly what that means asymptotically. Um, 
surface codes and color codes have the feature that the codes intersect at their mutual inflection point, not at the point where they intersect P equals P fail. And so that means that they continually get better and better and better as they go up the, you know, the, the threshold for any particular finite sized surface or color code uh, increases. But it asymptotes at the, wherever the level of the mutual inflection point is. The, the Bacon Shore codes, the example I mentioned earlier, they too get steeper and steeper. And they start getting better. They start moving forward like the surface and color codes. But then they start going retrograde. And they start going down, down, down until the threshold goes to 0. So not all infinite family of codes are good. You have to think about them and study them to see which ones are and which ones are not. Um, uh, to find what the threshold is, um, you know, you can look at, you can try to find these intersection points. Um, it turns out for the, the surface and the color codes, there's this uh, statistical mechanical onsatz you could make um, to uh, know what the scaling is going to be like near the intersection point. So you don't have to search for a crossing. You can sort of fit to a, a scaling that comes from a universality class in the stat mech model. Um, and a little warning here is that these curves look the exact same for error correction as they do for fault tolerant error correction. And so when you read a, a value for a threshold, you know, just be very careful that you're reading it for the right kind of noise model. Um, actually, maybe this is a, a good segue into noise models. Uh, what are the noise models that people think about? Uh, the natural one to start with is to say, well, let's imagine the, the depolarizing noise model. So we'll assume that uh, each, uh, each gate, preparation and gate is ideal, followed by the rising channel of a function of p. Let's say it'll be the parameter describing it. I will assume each measurement is preceded by that depolarizing channel, and we'll also flip the result with probability p. We need to do that last step because um, uh, uh, just because it, if the depolarizing channel flipped a bit and then we measured it, uh, it would say that measurement is correct. It reflected the actual value of the bit that got flipped. So to make the measurement itself faulty, we have to imagine the, the meter itself can fail independently of the data failing going into the uh, meter. Uh, so that's a natural noise model. It's one that's used in numerical estimates quite a bit. Uh, an alternative one is to assume that instead of the depolarizing channel, we have the bit flip channel followed by the phase flip channel or preceding it uh, for each of these operations. <coughs> so what that means is that a y error is actually um, less likely because it would require an x error and a z error to happen. There are correlations in it. Um, there's a, a, a phenomenal, I'll call it a phenomenological error model where we, we don't look at the details of the circuitry that's used to extract the syndrome. We just say that each one of those bits that we measure is just failing with probability p. Um, it's not a particularly realistic model, but uh, it is what allows us to do this mapping onto the, uh, the stat mech model for those uh, topological codes. And uh, something to be aware of is that um, uh, decoders are a lot, uh, for CSS decoders, because you have X checks and Z checks, it's natural to say, well, one of them looks for bit flips and the other looks for phase flips. And so I'll just do decoding classically on each of these. You can do that, but if you have the depolarizing channel, you're missing the fact that X and Z errors are more correlated, that it is, becomes more likely for an X and a Z to happen together than for them to happen separately. And so that kind of decoding is not really optimal for the depolarizing channel, and you'd have to have a more subtle decoder for that. Uh, but for the bit flip channel followed by the phase flip channel, it is optimal. And so in the literature, again, you have to be careful when you read these things. You might have to multiply threshold values by two-thirds to compare one value to another. You just, uh, that's the way you would map between those two channels if you were to decode this way. So again, you know, caveat emptor. Um, while those are nice models to use for numerical simulations, they're not necessarily easy to analyze uh, analytically. And so uh, in this model, in this setting, we will sometimes just look more generically at what's called local stochastic noise. Or we just say that uh, if you have error speci R specified locations in the circuit, so these are a location is where a gate is. A gate could be the identity gate, or it could also be a two qubit gate, or a preparation or a measurement. Um, in each one of these locations, the sum of the probabilities of all fault paths, so collections of faults with faults at those locations, is no larger than p to the R. Um, so that's very generic, and it doesn't. It's not assuming independent noise on each of these. Why would you possibly want to look at a noise model like this? It's so artificial. What's nice about it is that it's invariant under concatenation. So if you're trying to study how concatenated codes work, it's uh, very nice. It's got this sort of, it's uh, invariant through that process. Um, uh, you can also generalize to non-Markovian noise, where it's a bit more realistic, where you have a system bath Hamiltonian. And you can make that local or non-local. You can have system bath terms just wherever the gates are. You can make them happen wherever. Um, and there have been plenty of papers you know, looking at these generalizations. Um, 
And so, again, it just depends on the setting you're at as which noise model we're going to consider. I'm, I'm going to, for the rest of the talk, think mostly about like these depolarizing de noise channels. Okay, so now we, uh, we want to extract the syndrome. So we've got our code, uh, we've thought about the noise. How do I extract the syndrome? Uh, well, I need to measure these poly operators, these stabilizer generators or checks. There's a generic circuit that will allow you to do that for a general poly operator, um, uh, but it's not particularly fault tolerant. If you, for example, even had ideal gates and you have a bit flip here that happens in the middle of a, a circuit that's intended to extract the poly operator x, 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 uh, then the x operator, the failure that happens in the middle, will propagate through the control knot and create a correlated error in a pair of bits here, and that's, that's not good. We don't want errors to grow. Um, we want to keep them sort of bounded. And so uh, there are at least four possible solutions to this uh, debacle. Um, there's shore extraction, steam extraction, nil extraction, and topological extraction. So I'll, I'll talk about these in turn. So the shore extraction method, what we do is we extract the syndrome bit by bit, and for each bit of the syndrome that we want to extract, we prepare a, a so-called cat state. It's a, a state in the uh, repetition code that's the logical plus for the repetition code. Uh, and it'll work for every stabilizer code, so uh, any stabilizer code you have, you just, for that bit of syndrome, you extract it this way. And it turns out that uh, to increase the reliability of the uh, syndrome value that you extract, you need to repeat the extraction a number of times equal to t plus 1, where the distance of the code is uh, d equal to 2t. So um, this works, but requires some re repetition. A, uh, a little bit more efficient way of doing things is to use uh, Steen extraction. So this will, unfortunately, only work for all CSS codes, unlike the Shore method, which works for all codes. And what you do is you create an ancilla that's not a cat state, but a state in the code in which you are trying to do extract the uh, uh, syndrome from in the first place. So you double the number of qubits in this case. And you transversally so uh, uh, do C naughts between the uh, the data that you have in the ancilla, and the C naughts either go up or down depending on whether or not you're extracting a Z check or an X check. And then you destructively measure the ancilla and do classical decoding on the outcome that you obtain. And if you, you push through this, you'll see that the, it has this neat effect that it won't uh, propagate one error to two anywhere here. If there are no correlated errors in this uh, ancilla, it, it doesn't create correlated error anywhere. And, um, you will not disturb the data any more than just learning the information about the uh, syndrome bit that you're interested in. So, uh, so that's, a, that's a nice technique. Uh, you can be even more efficient um, at the expense of using even more qubits by using a bell, an encoded bell state in the code, not just the encoded plus or zero state. Uh, this is the nil extraction technique. Um, and what you do is in a single transversal operation between the ancilla and the data, you uh, learn both the X and the Z checks in parallel, so like in a single step. Um, turns out you also teleport the data to the other half of the bell encoded bell pair. Um, and you can imagine even uh, having these bell pairs be preloaded with the gate you want to do. So in addition to doing error correction, you can be doing an encoded gate at the same time. So that's pretty cool that in a single step you can be doing error correction and an encoded gate. Um, and like the previous protocols, at most one uh, data error will propagate data error. You won't get um, correlated errors. Uh, however, if there are correlated errors in any of these ancilla states, then they could propagate badly. So we need to ensure that we don't have correlated errors in the ancilla. And so that will be a distillation process that I'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. And uh, I should say that if you have a concatenated code, um, you will do this error correction at each level independently. So um, you're able to parallelize this whole extraction process a great deal uh, with um, concatenated codes. Okay, topological extraction. So there's this obsession in concatenated codes of keeping errors from propagating, but the topological approach is a little bit more laid back. It says, well, you can let the errors propagate a little bit, just as long as they only propagate out to a finite distance and then stop. So it's more thinking about the global structure of the code that will prevent the codes from propagating badly, not some sort of local structure that keeps them from propagating badly. So, uh, and the nice feature of this is that the structure of the code is what's preventing the error propagation, and you don't need any elaborate ancillas, and that's a, a huge deal. It turns out that this ancilla business is extremely complex and uh, consumes a large part of a fault-tolerant protocol. So the, the two criteria you need um, are that the uh, 
the code checks propagate to themselves and the syndrome checks propagate to themselves multiplied by a stabilizer element. So let me give you an example of this. This is the surface code. You'll be hearing a lot more about this later. Uh, this is the version where the qubits are on the vertices. Kataev drew the qubits on the edges, but you know, let's face it, qubits, are, they like to live on vertices, so I'm putting them on vertices. So, uh, and, and we've got a, a two-colored um, lattice here, and for each blue color, we have a check that it's a Z check, and for each yellow one, we have an X check. Uh, so we measure, you know, it's XXXX or ZZZ Z around the faces. And um, uh, so we either see not in, there's a syndrome bit at the center of each face, and we either control not into of that face to do the syndrome extraction. Uh, we don't do it fault tolerantly, we just do it, you know, transversely like this. And so that'll mean that errors will propagate, but the neat thing is if you look at the, uh, um, uh, if you have a stabilized generator here, in this case it's Z, 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 and you ask how does it propagate through this schedule, which is a clock schedule, where it says at time step one we do a C naught, uh, let's see here, we do a C naught from this qubit to the central qubit, at time step two we go from this qubit to the central one, three we go from here to the center, and four we go to the center. So if we go around each face clockwise, then it will propagate uh, that schedule and do that over the entire lattice. It'll propagate this stabilizer element, uh, Zs, it'll propagate through the C dots just to hitting each of the syndrome bits on the X checks twice, which would be no error at all. So, um, so the, the code check is propagated to itself. It doesn't, it's, nothing's detected here, so that's good. But this schedule is a bad schedule. This is one, I mean, I have to admit, this is one I had in a paper I wrote a while ago. It's not a good for um, doing a uh, uh, the fault tolerant uh, error correction because if you look at the syndrome check, so if I look at, well, what happens to uh, this bit here? So in the center, it's a zero. It's an eigenstate of uh, Z. How does a Z propagate outward from here? Well, it'll propagate outward and be detected as two independent errors by the X checks. And so uh, that's not good. And so. A uh, smarter thing to do is the book schedule, where we read things, where we have a schedule in book order. We do the C dots one, two, three, four on each of these faces. And if you do that, you can push it through and see that um, errors, which are not errors at all, just stabilizer uh, elements acting on the syndrome bits, uh, don't propagate to errors. So there's some, um, you have to do a little bit of thinking with, with the, these <coughs> lattice and tessellated codes, but if you do it right, you can uh, keep errors from propagating badly and, the and avoid this whole ancilla game. Um, one thing you have to do in topological code is repeat quite a bit the syndrome. So uh, we want to make sure that the syndrome is as reliable as the information, the data itself. So we repeat the syndrome extraction in time a number of times equal to the distance of the code. To, it's kind of like having a repetition code in time. And so that boosts the reliability of our syndrome to the same degree as which the code itself protects the information, which is the, let's say, the linear size of the uh, lattice that we're using. Um, that's in difference to the uh, concatenated coding approaches, which only need a single, single, single syndrome extraction. Um, however, there's a lot of post-selection because, uh, as you'll see in the ancilla distillation, you have to repeat many times. Okay, so let, let's talk about this ancilla verification. So, in the... Um, uh, Concatenated uh, coding approaches, uh, one way you can do that is uh, shore verification. So we could verify uh, each syndrome bit separately on a state that we prepare to be a uh, logical plus state. Um, so, uh, you know, we want to see that it's uh, reliable. We treat it itself as a code word. And if it happens to be a cat state, then all we have to add is a single C not gate. So, for example, here, this circuit in B, this is a figure from Brian Easton's thesis. Uh, he's got, um, you know, you do a Hadamard and some C knots, that would prepare a cat state. You add one more um, control knot and that will verify. Uh, you, you measure that and if it's, if you get a one, that you, means that you prepared a cat state on these three. If you get a zero, then you didn't and you try again. And so you just keep repeating until you get there. This is a slightly larger cat state. And if you had a code that was not a cat state, then you would just do the syndrome, the shore type extraction on it and using cat states themselves that had been verified. And so you can uh, uh, get a kind of an elaborate procedure for verifying um, uh, ancilla this way. And this, this part here, by the way, is the ancilla. This is just the preparation circuit coming from the generator of the Steen code that's uh, making this state. Uh, another way of verifying the ancilla is to not do it bit by bit, but, but do the, the whole thing at once. So you can actually, uh, if you just have a distance three code, you can um, prepare a pair of uh, encoded plus states, 
check them for Z errors against each other, and if they both pass, then check them for X errors against each other. This works for a, a distance three code, uh, but it becomes more elaborate if you have a distance uh, D code. Uh, for example, here's a, a result for the Golay code that's a uh, distance seven. Uh, this recursive procedure of verifying and then verifying again becomes kind of elaborate, but uh, the nice thing about this is that you don't have to, for e you don't need to do this for each bit of the syndrome. You do it just once for the entire state that extracts the entire syndrome. There are many other verification protocols that have been um, uh, developed since then. I don't have time to go over all of them. Some of them will once. There's a clever variant using Latin squares that um, uh, will force errors to uh, not propagate badly and, and compress the schedule for verification. You can use ancilla decoding where you can remove the whole verification step if you think about the entire process of how you do syndrome extraction as a whole. Uh, there's an overlap method that uh, has been recently developed by uh, Reichart and uh, 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 Petznik to um, uh, exploit overlaps and stabilizer generators. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of techniques to improve this, and this is just a tutorial, so I, this is sort of research level literature. Uh, if you want to learn more about those, I encourage you to read those. Uh, the, generally, though, the whole ancilla verification business, to give you a sense of how, how dire this is for fault-tolerant quantum computing, um, there's a somewhat recent paper uh, that estimates that 68% of uh, actual architecture de you know, designed uh, for doing fault-tolerant quantum computing is dedicated to just this whole ancilla pipeline. So, you know, if you're trying to compute, if you spend most of your time just trying to prepare ancilla, it seems like, well, I don't know, a lot of, uh, you're not doing what you want to do most of the time. Okay, so decoding. So now we've extracted the syndrome. We're supposed to figure out what we, you know, what do we do with the information that we, now that we have it. Uh, generally, there's a, I mean, if, if we assume that classical computing is instantaneous, we don't really worry about this. But, you know, we do want to think a little bit about uh, how difficult it is. And so the general trade-off we think about is how hard is it to infer what the errors are given the information versus how well does it perform uh, once we have used that information. So optimal decoding will find the, the recovery that's most likely to succeed, given the syndrome. And for quantum codes, that's different than finding the error most likely to have occurred. For classical codes, it's not. This is this difference in degenerate codes. I mean, if you go to see a doctor, do you want to prescribe you the recovery that's you know, most likely to succeed, or to tell you this is the most likely thing that you've got? You know, you're, you're really more interested in the former than the latter. And so that's why the optimal, it's, it's important to think about that thing, you know, the, just the difference between those two. Um, and uh, that said, though, this um, most likely error decoders works pretty well in practice. And so a lot of folks look at this as a decoder. Um, it's still difficult. It's uh, NP-hard in general, provably, uh, even though it's not optimal. Um, and for CSS codes, you can express this as uh, what's called an integer program. So you can throw it into your favorite you know, numerical calculator on your, uh, and uh, solve it to figure it out. Um, it, and for CSS codes, in fact, you can think of all CSS codes as a topological code in some geometry. And so you could come up with some crazy uh, statistical mechanics model for which there's an order disorder phase transition that maps to that threshold um, and understand things. Um, and for the special case of surface codes, that procedure becomes what's called minimum weight perfect matching, where you have all these syndrome bits and you try to pair together the syndrome bits I, and, and just pairwise, you don't have to think about higher order correlations. Uh, that algorithm generally runs in time uh, d to the 7.5, where d is the distance of the code. So, you know, a, a computer scientist will tell you this is only polynomial, but a uh, you know, programmer will tell you, oh my god, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot. Um, uh, recently, though, Austin Fowler and collaborators have tailored the algorithm specifically for the surface code and showed that you can actually parallelize this down to constant complexity. So that's pretty exciting that, uh, you know, that's, you can't go any better than that. And so um, this assumption that we made before of instantaneous classical computing is, you know, plausible if you use a decoder like this. It's not optimal, but it's, uh, it's pretty good and it's very fast. Um, there's sort of an intermediate, uh, well, for um, uh, concatenated codes, um, instead of trying to decode the concatenated code all at once, you can do it level by level. So at each level of the code, you decode it and hope that that does something, you know, that does well overall. Um, so that's called uh, level decoding. Uh, or you can go and send some information back and forth between the levels. 
um, through a kind of belief propagation network or a renormalization group approach where you get, make guesses for what the recovery is at a fine scale and pass messages back and forth between the levels of concatenation to iterate and can finally converge on a solution. And that tends to be fast also. It's not constant, but it's, it's logarithm in the distance as opposed to some polynomial in the distance. So I'd say if you, you know, in practice, something like, a, you know, one of these constant or log depth uh, decoders is the one that you want to use. These polynomial time or NP-hard decoders might be good for assessing the best performance you could get out of these codes. So not worrying about the decoding complexity, just asking, you know, um, what we're hope for out of these codes. They're, they're useful for that, but not for anything in practice. Okay, so now we got to uh, get the encoded gates. Uh, how do we, we've done fault tolerant quantum error correction. I've told you all the pieces for that. Now how do I process it in encoded form? Again, the, here there are two general strategies for this. So one is to use uh, transversal operations and the other is to use code deformation. So in transversal operations, the idea is that you, uh, each one of your code words is stored in some block, so I've drawn it as like a plane here. And anytime you want to do an encoded computation, like say a controlled knot, you do it transversely between, let's say, nearest neighbor planes. And so you do the same operation on every, between every pair of qubits in neighboring planes. Now, if you don't have a kind of pancake quantum computer like this, then you're going to have to move, add a, a bunch of additional movement things to make them nearest neighbor kind of operations to do pairwise, and that itself will add difficulties and complexities. So um, this is a good uh, approach 3D quantum computer. For a 2D quantum computer, it's, it presents some challenges. Uh, a 2D quantum computer, however, can do uh, code deformation. So you could take the lattice and deform the lattice uh, and make it go through a bunch of gyrations and come back to itself. And if you do it in the right way, you can actually have encoded, uh, you can have that information transform and you can do an encoded gate that way. There's this, uh, these so-called Turaya Vero codes that can in fact do universal quantum computation just by deformation, by code deformations. Unfortunately, these are not stabilizer codes though and it's not even known how to efficiently extract the syndrome from these things there. Uh, but they're kind of neat examples of uh, how code deformation can give you uh, very powerful uh, results. So uh, how do transversal gates work? Well, you sort of got a hint of it a little bit in the extraction protocols. Um, I'll distinguish between what I'll call transversal gates, which are where the gates act independently on each physical qubit in the code block, and strictly transversal where it's called. So a transversal operation might do like a C naught between the first matching set of qubits and a C phase on the next ones and a controlled Y on the next one, whatever. Each one could be different but independent of the other ones, whereas a strictly transversal gate will be exactly the same between every pair of uh, matched qubits. And we know that for uh, any stabilizer code, we can do X, Z, and C naught uh, transversally, and even a destructive measurement transversely. So by destructive, I mean when you measure the bits, the bits are gone. There's no, it's not like you've projected in, uh, the code word into an eigenstate of sigma, logical X or logical Z, but the bits are just, uh, you're outside of the code space. So we can do that transversally. Um, we can actually, for CSS codes, do a lot of things strictly transversally. Um, so we can do X or Z strictly transversely, say, for odd length CSS codes, and even some even length ones. And when we have X and Z strictly transversal, we can do the Hadamard for strong CSS. So these are codes for which the um, H1 and H2 in Todd's talk would be the exact same matrix, um, like the Steen code, for example. You get this S or phase gate transversal for what are called doubly even CSS codes. So, uh, and codes of a certain length, the, the length has to be um, uh, 2L plus 1 mod 4. And if you do that, then if you use controlled uh, I to the 2L plus 1 gates, it'll give you um, uh, the S gate transversely. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not supposed to be controlled. It's supposed to be Z, Z to the, uh, uh, oh yeah, controlled I, I'm sorry. So controlled I is a single qubit gate. So like um, uh, S is, for example, controlled I. Um, so doubly even, it basically is just saying that every, uh, the weight of every generator of your stabilizer is a multiple of eight. It's a fancy way of saying that. Um, a uh, multiple of four, I'm sorry, and T is if it's a multiple of eight. Uh, if it's quadruply even. So there's ways to get, you know, encoded gates to be trans strictly transversal, but you can't get them all transversal. Um, this is the, the so-called Easton-Nil theorem. It was proved earlier for stabilizer codes, but the Easton-Nil theorem works for all codes. Um, however, there is a kind of a neat workaround with the three-dimensional color codes. Uh, you can ask me about this later, but there's a way to 
make it so that the only non-transversal operation you have is quantum error correction. And since you have to do that anyway, and that's local quantum processing, maybe that's not such a big deal. So uh, if you had a three-dimensional computer, uh, you could get away with transversal operations everywhere except for um, quantum error correction. Um, once you have uh, encoded uh, magic states, then the S, T, and H gates uh, become transversal. So if you had a, if you, you just had as a source these pi over 2, pi over 4 plus states, the circuits I showed earlier, they all involve operations that I said were transversal. So that means that there's a transversal way to get these gates uh, for any code. If you're stuck over here in this land without having these nice things, you can still get everything transversal modulo not knowing how you prepared this pi over 2, pi over 4 plus state. And so we need to have some way to prepare these magic states. Um, we can't do it transversally because we can't get everything transversal, but uh, we need to get high fidelity copies of these uh, prepared by some mechanism. And in fact, you can even get uh, uh, these so-called uh, non-destructive measurements by using magic <coughs> states as well. Uh, you don't need to have them, but they're handy to have. Uh, code deformation, I'm actually not going to say a whole lot about code deformation because uh, Robert's going to be talking about that. Um, so, uh, but the basic idea of this is that you have a surface code and one of those X or Z checks we remove from the code and that creates a logical qubit. And then we can um, do, uh, we can move, move these kind of holes around one another to affect a computation. This is like a space-time picture of the holes braiding around one another. And as they braid around one another, you can get uh, logic to happen. Um, and uh, it's, it's very similar to, I'd say, uh, cluster state quantum computation, where you're driving things around by just measurements. And you're going to hear more about this from Robert. Um, so uh, magic, how do I get an encoded magic state? So I'm supposed to, uh, where does this thing come from in the first place? Well, I can, there's two techniques we can use. We can inject it by teleportation or by code deformation. So in teleportation, what we do is we, um, uh, we assume that we've got some way to make a, an encoded zero, like, for example, we, through quantum error correction or through these distillation protocols I talked about earlier. Uh, we make a bell pair, and we unencode half of it and teleport the magic state in, and we get the encoded magic state that way. Um, uh, the problem with that is that uh, when we've decoded bell pair, it's very exposed in that region, and so uh, we're we get concerned about noise there. Uh, for surface codes, so another way we could do it is we could just grow it. So we could take our magic state and then just start growing a code around it like a spider weaving a web around and around and around. Um, so then it becomes better and better protected. But at the early stages, it's not very well protected. And depending how slowly the spider goes around, it's more exposed to noise in the early stages of growth. But either way, these will give you states that are um, magic states in the code, but they might not have you know, perfect fidelity because this injection process itself is not perfect. So we want to distill them in encoded form. So we want to, suppose we have uh, many copies of the uh, uh, magic state, but they're not perfect and we want to get higher quality, of, quality, higher quality versions of these. Well, since they're in encoded form, we can assume that the circuitry used to distill these is all perfect because it's encoded, so it's arbitrarily reliable. And um, to distill these pi over 4 states, it, it turns out we can run this, the coherent Steen encoding circuit in reverse. And, and you send, um, I'm sorry, this is the Reed-Muller circuit, I should say. The Reed-Muller circuit in reverse, and you get 15 copies in, and one copy comes out. And to get the pi over 2, you can use seven copies uh, in and get one copy out using the Steen encoder run in reverse. So I, I call this unencoding to distinguish it from decoding. Um, so. Uh, there are thresholds for this, and uh, it turns out that the thresholds are much higher than the thresholds for fault tolerant quant all the other operations in fault tolerant quantum computing. So for the pi over 4 state, you can show that it's like 14.6%. You can reach up to 50% for um, the pi over 2 states. And, uh, but there's a lot of repetition involved here, just like there is for ancilla distillation. Reducing this overhead is an area of active research. Um, uh, it's the kind of thing that I think is being studied in uh, uh, Mark Heiligman's QCS program at IARPA. It's an exciting program that looks at the kinds of ways to reduce the overhead in fault-tolerant quantum computing. Uh, so let me uh, finish here with uh, just a couple of words about the accuracy threshold. So um, the, uh, as I mentioned, that's a tutorial unto itself to talk about how one estimates the threshold, um, either using Monte Carlo numerical techniques 
We're using analysis techniques with exotic terms like extended rectangles, malignant pair counting, self-avoiding walks, et cetera. They really are tutorials unto themselves. Um, the, uh, the, the values that you see in the literature, they, uh, they range from you know, up to about 3% to like 10 to the minus 6, you know, depending on the noise models that you look at. Um, where it'll end up, I, you know, I don't know. And what's most realistic, I don't know. It's an active area. Um, upper bounds are particularly hard to come by. Uh, the best upper bound we know is 29.3%. So you're never going to get a threshold um, uh, higher than that. But that's not particularly informative, uh, I would say. But you know, it's something you can prove. Uh, so it's difficult to uh, um, it's difficult to upper bound it, and the lower bounding requires specialized techniques. So uh, um, this is you know we're getting more into research level stuff. What are all these thresholds, and what what? And maybe you'll hear more about this in some of these later talks. Um, uh, but it's an, you know we we're interested in getting the highest thresholds we can with the lowest amount of resources. That's kind of the name of the game in fault tolerant quantum computing. So to, to summarize, I, I've told you about the four components of a fault-tolerant quantum computing protocol. I've given you kind of a high-level view of what all these things are about. And I've explained how you then use those four components to uh, simulate a circuit, an ideal circuit, uh, arbitrarily well. So when you put all these techniques together, it does allow you to do quantum computing even in the presence of faults to both the data and the processing. You can simulate an ideal circuit arbitrarily well. And the amount of overhead that you incur is only polylogarithmic in the size of the original circuit. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thanks. Other questions? <clears throat> Pardon me, questions? Sorry, just did you hear that? Or should I, I I'll repeat the question. Uh, so the question was the 68% number that I quoted for uh, the overhead for the Ancilla pipeline. Uh, the question was, what algorithm was that for? Um, that was, uh, I, I actually forget the, the specific algorithm. It's more of an architecture, generally. It's true that uh, it does depend on uh, what the algorithm is to get the specifics. Um, that paper was mostly focused on architectures. That I'm, I don't know. It would be a bit of conjecture. I don't remember exactly. Another question? Yeah, Todd? Do you expect things like that to be highly dependent on the problem or would it be more like generic run a different algorithm that would kind of be uh, So the question was, do I believe that this overhead for ancilla distillation to be generic? Yes, I believe that it will uh, take quite a bit uh, for any algorithm, I think it will take a substantial fraction of the resources. Whether or not it's always 68% or not, no, I don't believe that. But um, uh, I believe it will be substantial. I, yeah, I do. OK. Should we thank Todd and Andrew again? <laughs> we have a bit of a break now, and then at 10.50, we'll continue. Okay, how about 11? <laughs>